And so um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kathy Baumgartner, our Associate Dean for Academic and Faculty Affairs and Professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health for the University of Louisville School of Public Health and Information Sciences. Thanks, Paige. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here this uh, afternoon and welcome to our second presentation in our four-part Whitson Lecture Series. In recognition of World AIDS Day, first established in 1988 in the ongoing effort to, <clears throat> excuse me, to eliminate the HIV epidemic, we are very grateful to you, Dr. Ralph DiClemente, and he will be sharing his expertise on the HIV prevention services needed for adolescents. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that this series is being funded by the Woodson Endowment which was established via an anonymous gift in 2014. I also want to thank the leaders in our school Student Government Association, especially Daniel Malik and Nana Bullock, who were instrumental in pulling this webinar series together. Also many thanks to the Office of External Affairs, to Paige Wills, Melissa Schreck for handling the event promotion as well as the registration. I'm now gonna turn it over to Daniel Malik, an MPH student in the epidemiology concentration and the vice president of our Student Government Association. So take it away, Daniel. Thank you, Dr. Baumgartner. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ralph DeClemente, who chairs the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, professor and associate dean of public health innovations at New York University School of Global Public Health. Dr. DiClemente's research focuses on developing interventions to reduce the risk of HIV and STDs among vulnerable adolescents and young adult women and improving community-based prevention programs. He has developed 10 CDC-defined evidence-based interventions for vulnerable adolescents, young women, and men that the CDC and other federal agencies have disseminated domestically and globally. He has authored more than 600 peer-reviewed publications and written and edited 20 books on HIV prevention, community-based research, research methods, adolescent health, and global health promotions. Without further ado, I present Dr. Ralph Dickelman. Ah, perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. It's, again, my, my privilege, my pleasure. I'm excited to be here. And with the help of Paige Willis, we're going we're gonna to cover a lot of ground. So uh, if you have questions, please hold them to the end. If we run out of time at the end, I'm always available by email. So send me an email and I'll get back to you. and We can address those questions individually. Right. So why don't we get started? So Paige, uh, first slide, please. Here we are. You so, should be there. Yep. You got it. So a hidden population and why we're gonna to get to the point, why is it a hidden population? Next slide page. Okay, again, welcome. Diversity is important. And so I wanna welcome you in many, many different tongues. Next slide page. Yeah, children and young people in a world of AIDS. Uh, this was not always an issue, and uh, we're going to show you why it was not and how that's rapidly changed. Next slide, Paige. Mm -hmm. Youth AIDS awareness. Again, not an issue until, oh, approximately 15 to 20 years ago, it became clear that young people are actually a priority population at risk of HIV and of course, STD. Next slide, Paige. The, this was an early White House panel that I actually had the pleasure of being on. Uh, and this has not changed much since this article was written. Uh, an estimated 25% of young people, 13 to uh, 19 years of age, acquire HIV. But interestingly, almost 50% of new infections are acquired by young folks under the age of 25. Next slide, Paige. Well, a generation at risk. 
and you'll see there were a number of special panels convened, uh, committees convened, et cetera, to, this, to determine what is the risk for young people and equally, and, and if not more important, what do we do about it? How do we reduce that risk? Next slide, Paige. Uh, thank you. So the good news. The good news is that adolescents as a group are healthier than they've perhaps ever been. The next slide, Paige. Uh, the, yeah, the not so good news is that uh, annual rates of HIV in the United States, well, while they're going down, next slide, then here's the not so good news, next slide. While they're going down, the trajectory is a downward trajectory, as we just pointed out. The rates for young people, yeah, the rates for young people have increased 2% from the prior year of the survey of their analysis. So overall, rates of HIV infection are decreasing about 18%, except among young people where they're increasing about 2%. That's a cause for alarm. Next slide, Paige. Well, I want to give you a little bit of the lay of the land, so to speak, or the characteristics of the epidemic. As you'll notice, new HIV diagnoses. And you'll see, if you look at young people, 20 to 24, they are the second most impacted age group after the 25 to 29 year olds. Next slide, please. Now the epidemic does not uniformly affect young people and adolescents. Uh, Black or African-American adolescents are disproportionately impacted vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Hispanic, uh, Latinx, white, multiple races, Asian, Native American, and Asian Pacific Islander. Next slide, Paige. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to see this slide here. Uh, again, this is the same data, but in a slightly different presentation, number of HIV infections. And you can see Black or African American race, the Aries for the age groups 13 to 24 and 25 to 39 are disproportionately represented. Next slide, Paige. So the persons living with HIV, so diagnosed and living with HIV, uh, if you look at it regionally, you'll notice that the South has the greatest preponderance of folks, 13 to 29, living with an HIV diagnosis. Uh, followed, of course, by Northeast, West, and then Midwest. Next slide, Paige, please. Undiagnosed HIV. Uh, and you can see that by age group, it's the younger people, 13 to 24, that have the, the greatest preponderance of undiagnosed HIV infection. Next slide, Paige. Uh, so here we go. So H infected, and this is the cascade, as, as it's often called, the treatment cascade. So we looked at the number of people HIV infected, the number that are linked to care, the number that are engaged in care, the number that are initiated on antiretroviral therapy, and the number that are virally suppressed, meaning we can't detect the virus. And so theoretically, they cannot transmit the virus either. And this is for 12 to 24 years of age. Notice, unfortunately, that steep decline. What we would like to see, according to WHO, is 90, 90, 90. 90% 90 of people tested, 90% of people linked to care and on treatment, and 90% suppressed. However, of the people who were infected, only 12% are virally suppressed, which is again, a cause for alarm. 
as the people who are not virally suppressed, it could the uh, the disease could adversely affect them, but it also allows transmission from them to uninfected partners. Next slide, please. Now, COVID, you can't, COVID is sort of the 300 pound gorilla in the room. You can't talk, have a presentation really without COVID. However, what I wanted to show here is that the same factors that drove the HIV epidemic, the same determinants of health, are the same factors that drive the COVID epidemic. It's deja vu, if you will. Essentially, these are the same key social determinants of, of health behavior, irrespective of COVID or HIV. Next slide page. So every day I wake up and I put on CNN because I'm hoping that there's going to be a vaccine. And I had the same hope for a COVID vaccine, and that was fulfilled. We have effective, safe vaccines for COVID. However, the AIDS the HIV, a vaccine is not available, and it doesn't look like a vaccine will be available in the foreseeable future. Next slide, please. So state of the nation challenges facing youth related to STD. STDs and HIV kind of go hand in hand. In fact, HIV in many sense is a STD. So next slide page. Every day I like to think of what I call sexual roulette. Young people who are often ill-informed and have misconceptions about sexual behavior engage in what I would call sexual roulette. The opportunity is not only to acquire HIV, but there's unfortunately an opportunity to acquire a host of other sexually transmitted infections. Next slide page. For example, one in four Americans has a sexually transmitted disease. Half of F STDs occur in young people, not unlike HIV. Next slide page. This is recent data from the CDC. It came out at, well, three or four months ago. So I wanted to give, keep you updated. STDs or STIs, have increased 31% from 2013 to 2017. And you'll notice the increases in syphilis and in gonorrhea. Uh, these, this is pretty startling, given that we've been confronting HIV for a number of years since 1981. And yet, the rates for STIs, which is essentially a good barometer for sexual risk, continue to increase. That, again, is another cause for concern. Next slide page. Ah, so if we wanted to look regionally again, prevalence of chlamydia, which is the most reported STI to the, to the CDC, you'll notice some regions have very high rates. Uh, you'll notice the South, for example, has very high rates. Uh, you'll notice uh, that some regions have very low rates. Next slide, please. Ah. If we break out the regions, uh, the states into just geographic regions, some of the lowest rates or prevalence of chlamydia is in the Northeast. And when I looked at this slide, someone asked me, by the way, they said, what do you take away from this slide? And I said, what I take away from this slide is if you're going to have unprotected sex and you don't know your partner, it, the best place to have it is in Vermont. Because the, the prevalence is much lower for chlamydial infection in Vermont than in other regions of the country, particularly the South. Next slide, please. 
Well, teens and sex. I think I've convinced you, if you were needed any convincing, that young people are having sex and they're experiencing the adverse sequelae, STDs and HIV. So the question is, what do we do about that? How do we address that issue? How do we help protect young folks? Which is, in my estimation, in my opinion, is our most valuable resource. Next slide, please. Changing behavior. STIs, HIV, much of it is driven by behavior, if not all of it. But it's really difficult to change behavior. It's a Sisyphean task. You, to get behavior to change is one part of the equation, but the key is can you sustain that change over long periods of time? Next slide, Paige. So what do we do? Uh, the Just Say No campaign was, needless to say, in my perspective, a failure. Uh, so that is not the answer. Just say no. Next slide, please. But how, how do we teach our young people about sex? Next slide, please. And what do people need to know about sex? Next slide, please. So how do we apply the lessons that we've learned over the last 30 years or so? Next slide, please. The CDC has what they call their compendium of HIV prevention interventions with evidence of effectiveness. You can find this on their website, and this will list the different effective programs by subpopulation. So if you want to find a particular program for a particular population, that would be the best place to start. Next slide, please. The CDC has also started a diffusion of ineffective behavioral interventions branch known as short as Debbie. The goal is to take effective programs that have been tested in usually randomized control trials, to take those programs and to scale them so they can be disseminated and reach a broader audience. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of what CDC reports. It's their systematic review of effective HIV behavioral interventions, and they're always updating this. So you'll be able to stay abreast of the new programs that are developed. Next slide, please. Well, applications in practice, that's what we want to talk about. Clinical practice being one of those applications. Next slide, please. So clinical practice is one aspect where we can do intervention research and intervention practice. How do we convince young people to modify their risk behavior? One, another aspect is linking science to community action. How do we develop more community-based programs that are outside of the clinical milieu? Next slide, please. So community-based participatory health research is one approach that folks are gravitating to, to engage the community in the solution, in creating the solution by helping to develop and implement these programs. Now, many times these programs have been based on small groups or individual counseling, effective and they are effective. However, they also can be expensive. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the new media. How do we take effective counseling-based approaches and how do we change the modality of delivery to be cost-effective and to reach a larger audience? Next slide, please. Uh, this is one of the programs we developed called Sahara. By the way, that is my daughter, uh, Sahara. 
when she was a little younger than she is today. Uh, next slide, please. And Sahara is essentially a program that's been adapted from a previous program we developed called SISTA. SISTA is a very effective program. However, it's labor intensive. And the many community-based organizations do not have the financial wherewithal to support those programs. So we've created Sahara, which is essentially a computer-based program for African-American young women. And you can see the different elements of the program. We've maintained the core elements, but we've changed the implementation modality to reach a larger audience. Next slide, Paige, please. You can see young people still come in as part of our trial and they put on headphones so only they can hear the computer and the computer walks them through the program. So they move essentially at their own pace. This allows them to repeat certain segments of the program that may be directly relevant to their behavior. Next slide, Paige. Uh, can you click on this? Thank you. Welcome back to Sahara, sister. I'm so glad that you decided to join me today for more fun and knowledge. Now, in today's session, we're going to be talking about sex and some of the negative consequences of having sex. I'm also going to show you some ways to protect yourselves. Are you ready? So this, this is Nakia. She's worked with us for over 25 years. Nakia is a virtual health educator and a real health educator, but making the transition from face to face to virtual is not easy. Like the best, the hardest thing to do is to stand in front of a camera and appear natural. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to give you an example of some of the one of the vignettes. I mean, I'm just saying. I'm not too sure about you doing all this talking about using condoms. I don't like the way condoms feel, and you know that. Besides, we haven't used them before, so why you want to start now? Look, I know we are, haven't always used condoms in the past, but I want us to start now. I don't want us to have to worry about me getting pregnant every time. I just want us to enjoy being together, baby. All right, baby. All right, baby. I see this means a lot to you. And you know you mean a lot to me. I guess we try and see what's up. Can we start right now? Uh, thank you. They're very good at this. And uh, these are two young people that I give you a little background that attended Clark University in Atlanta and they were in the theater arts program. Uh, so they were able to perform as, they, as they've known each other for a long time when, in fact, they had just met. But creating videos, again, is one way to disseminate a program. Next slide, please. Yo, what's up? Nothing, chilling, what about you? Yo, what's up, man, what you need? You know, the good stuff. Yeah, take a look. No doubt, five, right? You know how to roll it, right? Come on, what you take me for? You need an extra one? Hell no. All right, yo, you be safe, dog. Do 
Did you get it? Because I'm out of here if you didn't get it. Well, relax. It's in the bag. Just chillin' let a man do his thing. What are you doing? I'm just making sure it's long enough. That came out of a wrapper, right? Of course it came out of a wrapper. What you take me for? <laughs> Do you know what you're doing? Me, I'm just uh, checking for holes. You know, you can't trust these street stuff. Uh huh. Give me a condom, I'll um, show you how to use it. What? Oh, yeah, work it, girl. Just leave a little room at the top for you all the time. Pinch it like this. Think you know how to do it now? Of course I know. I was just making sure you knew. All right then. Time for us to get it on. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> what? You got more condoms, right? Okay, perfect. Uh, so essentially, media can really be engaging and can actually be a lot more expressive than presentations or even individual counseling. In fact, let me ask you a trivia question that you can, next cocktail party. I happen to be meeting with a producer, uh, movie producer and a video producer. And I asked him, how long do I have in order to engage millennials? Because we were creating videos that we were putting on the web. And in fact, these were videos that we were gonna test on US Navy ships as STD and HIV prevention strategies. And what do you think? was the answer. How much time do you think you have to engage? Oh, Lindsay's really good. Uh, millennials, before they, they dist they're distracted, they turn their attention elsewhere. I have one guess, uh, and it's a good one, yeah? But think about it, how much time would you have to put a video on? in place, have someone see that video, wow, and then be engaged. Well, you know what? You, unfortunately, for me, I know Jelani, uh, are a very educated audience. And that reminds me not to ask you that question ever again. The answer, in fact, is 11 seconds. If I create a video, and I'm going to show you that video. I have 11 seconds for that video to capture your attention, or I've lost it. Now, to be honest, I didn't realize it was that quick, but it seems that a lot of folks in the audience did realize that. So yeah, so we're creating even smaller and smaller and smaller, shorter, shorter videos. The idea is to be impactful, but not be too long. Next slide page, please. So we looked, by the way, short term, I have long term results. Uh, and you can see nice effects as part of a randomized trial. Uh, in condom use increased markedly over the three month period. Uh, and that's what we want to see. In fact, 
the young women in the intervention were six times as likely to use condoms consistently during sex vis-a-vis -vis the health education control condition. Next slide, please. Well, Horizons is another intervention we've created, again, for young women. Next slide. And um, this, again, is a, it's a combination, it's a hybrid, if you will, of group interaction, counseling, and video-based. Can you play that page, please? Wait, do you have a condom? No, nah, I want to fill out of it. You can film me. You know I got you. Really? It's just you and me. It's not like we kicking it with other people, right? Marcus. Just this once. You can trust me. Okay. So again, videos, pictures can say a whole lot in a picture and they say it in a more engaging and captivating manner than I would if I was presenting to a group. Next slide, please, Paige. Try that one. Nobody's home, right? I said I like you. I'm not ready for sex, though. What are we waiting for? We're not waiting on anything. I said I'm not ready. Why not? I don't have to give you a reason. I just said I wasn't ready. But when I am, I'll let you know so we can go get tested. What do you mean get tested? I don't need to get tested. I'm good. I know I don't have any diseases. Good nothing. You better go get tested before you even think about getting any of this. Okay. A key point, and this is a time we need to really amplify it. A key issue in sexual relationships, in fact, in any relationships, is communication. How do you interface with your partner? How do you interface with your employer? How do you interface with other students? How do you interface with colleagues? One of the things we've emphasized in every intervention is different types of communication styles, assertive, aggressive, and passive. She, in fact, is demonstrating assertive communication, letting people know how you feel without going over the top and offending them. But she's taking control for her health, not turning, not relinquishing that control to someone else. Next slide, Paige. Uh, this was eventually published in the uh, Archives of Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine, subsequently re renamed JAMA Pediatrics. Very nice effects for reducing chlamydia, as well as reducing recurrent chlamydial infections over a year follow-up. Next slide, please. So technology, we move from face-to-face, group-based counseling. Now we're moving into a whole new genre, mobile technology. Uh, and the world continues to evolve. And you're gonna be more expert on this than I am. But the question that we need to wrestle with is, as the world continues to evolve and our technology becomes more sophisticated, how do we harness that technology to promote adolescent health? Next slide, please. This is an intervention that was designed to promote maintenance of sexual health behavior. Next slide, please. Next, it's gonna keep moving down. There you go. This used a health coach approach. So every young woman who entered the program was assigned to a health coach. Much like now, if you wanted to uh, work out at home, Peloton, for example, you would link in and there would be an instructor or a coach that you would link into. We did this almost 10 years ago, before Peloton, before the health coach, before telemedicine. 
but we realized if you want people to use something, you need to make it convenient and you need to make it attractive. Next slide, please. So again, we have basic elements of the intervention. Uh, ethnic and gender pride we think is critical. Communication, as I've pointed out. Knowledge, of course, is basic. Uh, skills. We want to give people the skills to use condoms as well as to do resistance training as well as a skill. And then healthy relationships. What is a healthy relationship? Many people don't know, unfortunately. So we have different kinds of games and scenarios where we can decide what's healthy and what's not healthy. Next slide page, please. So we tested this intervention. It was a mobile phone based intervention. Next slide, please. And in order to do an intervention on mobile phones, you need to do a quick risk appraisal. So we would schedule times to touch base with the clients. Our head coach, our health coach would call them and quickly assess what were the barriers to practicing safer sex. And we would address one barrier. And then we would call back every two months, do the same assessment. If that same issue was problematic, we would address it again with a different strategy. If that issue had been resolved, we'd go to the next issue. So it's much like a clinical approach where you're picking up a chart and seeing how well people are doing and then modifying your treatment based on their progress. Next slide page, please. The uh, intervention effects were published. Uh, again, this was JAMA Pediatrics and great effects, 50% reduction in chlamydia, 60% reductions in gonorrhea. And this actually was over a three year period when the adolescents were screened at baseline and at each and six month intervals thereafter using the uh, DNA amplification assays. Next slide page. And behavior changes, as you can see, all followed the direction we wanted to go. The intervention group was higher on condom protected sex. Uh, the intervention group was lower on episodes of sex while high on drugs or alcohol. Also a key issue as adolescents age, then alcohol and drugs become a much more prominent threat. Next slide page. This is the table, table data, a little different look but essentially the same, same findings, plus a re slight reduction in number of sex partners. Unknown caller. So interestingly enough, next slide page. Well, what was interesting is that um, when we started this study, there were some folks, naysayers, if you will, who said, well, young people will not be able to keep the, uh, the contact schedule. They're contacting their health coach every two months over three years. Well, interestingly enough, uh, when we looked at the uh, contact, next slide, please. Uh, we found that 72% of all the scheduled contacts were completed in the intervention arm. And then we wanted to see, is there a differential effect by arms? and 68% of all contacts were maintained in the control arm. So yes, adolescents will maintain a schedule of contacts if they feel engaged, if they feel the contact is valuable, and if they're enjoying the person that's providing that contact. Again, this is the article, I can send you a copy. If you request it, not a problem. Next slide, Paige. Thank you. So the big issue is translating big media to small mobile devices. You've seen some of the big media we've done. Now the question is with Apple Watch and a number of other watches, can we take those larger videos and send them to people's watches and deliver the intervention really personal whenever people want to look at it? 
Next slide, please. And we, we've done big media and small media. This is a large mass media study we did in four cities, randomized and yoked by region of the country. Next slide, please. And can you hit this, please? I present to you the honorees of the class of 2008, Felicia Adams, graduating with honors. Cynthia Anderson, graduating at the top of her class. Andrew Bynum, graduating with a perfect 4-0. Sean Cooper, graduating with a state football championship and gonorrhea. <gasps> Memories, diplomas, STDs, some things last a lifetime. Life is what you make it. Be safe. So the study was called Impacts, named after the four cities that participated. And the tagline is, life is what you make it. Be safe. So we've created these videos. Next slide, Paige. Girl, let's play this me one. and Pablo went out last night. And we did it. Are you serious? Y'all have protection, right? He pulled out. He's experienced. Trust me, he knows what he's doing. I hope you know what you're doing. Yeah, he's experienced, all right. I'm giving you an STD. What's your social security number? If you are sexually active, use condoms correctly every time. Be safe. Okay, now next page, please. And we're gonna skip this video for the sake of uh, time. And so here's the producer and myself getting what's called the Telly Award. So four of the videos that we created won awards. Uh, next slide, please. So next. Yeah. So we often talk about prevention and treatment as two different sides of the fence, when in fact, that's not the case. Any assessment, uh, any visit to a physician should be an opportunity to do prevention. In fact, we often talk about an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, but we don't invest the effort in prevention. So essentially in HIV, for example, uh, folks who maintain their drug treatment and reduce their viral loads to an undetectable level, that is prevention. It's preventing them from infecting uninfected sex partners. So one thing is again, we can't be, we don't want to talk about this schism. I'm doing prevention, I'm doing treatment. We're doing both. Point of care counseling. We have a lot of point of care tests now. Uh, we have rapid uh, tests for alcohol use. Within one minute, you can determine the, uh, if a person's been drinking an, uh, a fair amount, 500 nanograms per milliliter. How do we involve parents in prevention? This has always been a holy grail. And it's very tough to accomplish. How do we engage parents in prevention with young people? How do we talk about sex? Now, I don't know. Um, since, uh, I don't know where you are uh, in Ohio. I personally actually lived in Ohio for a year, enjoyed it greatly, but I'm more familiar where, with Georgia. And Georgia did not allow sex education in the schools comprehensive sex ed. It's an abstinence-only state. Well, that's not a very effective strategy. Uh, and finally, teens, teens need more intensive prevention services. If we identify someone who's engaging in a risk behavior and we don't have the resources or the wherewithal to intervene, let's refer them just like we refer people for anything else. Oh, Kentucky. Well, thank you, Tariq. Louisville is in Kentucky. Yeah, it shows you my geography is horrible, spending, even though I spent 20 years in Georgia. Um, next slide, please. So 
basic knowledge necessary, but knowledge is not sufficient to change behavior and equally important, it's not sufficient to sustain healthy behavior change. What we really need to focus on is how do we motivate people? Motivation is critical. If we can find the secret to motivation, we can bottle it and then distribute it. And maybe more people would be vaccinated against COVID. Maybe more people would eat a healthier diet. Maybe more people would exercise. So it's not that they don't know or there's a lack of knowledge and it's not a, an issue of skill per se, those skills can be acquired. It's the motivation to use that knowledge and those skills. Next slide, please. Next, please. Next. So Helen Keller, a person I admire greatly. Next, please. Once said that next, that vision is the art of seeing what is not visible. Uh, she also noted that the blindest person she ever met was the person with 2020 eyesight and no vision. So we, if we strive for an HIV free generation, we have to have a vision of a free generation, a big picture of what can we do to promote that generation of HIV free young people. Next slide, please. The key issue of course is scaling out. We have effective interventions. The CDC website will have, a, will have many of them. The question becomes, can we take those randomized trials and move those into sustainable community-based intervention models? That's the challenge at the moment. Next slide, please. So as I note, and again, Helen Keller, I'll be using a lot of Helen Keller lines since she's one of my most popular folks. Uh, science has a cure for a number of evils, but they don't have a cure for apathy of human beings. How do we overcome the inertia about HIV, we still get approximately 40,000 new diagnosed cases a year. That exceeds the number of people who are killed in automobile fatalities in the United States. Next slide, please. Young people are galvanized. They have a voice. Previously, that was not the case. Uh, let me give you a uh, short vignette here, a short story. In 1983, we did a study of young people on HIV, we collected the data as we should have, analyzed it, and submitted it to the American Journal of Public Health. The reviews came back. Well-written, interesting topic. Uh, readers may find it interesting. However, the reviewer went on to say, I recommend we don't publish it because we all know that journal space is at a premium. And we all know adolescents don't get AIDS. Adolescents don't get AIDS. Fast forward a few years, 50% of all HIV diagnoses are people under the age of 25. 25% of all new diagnoses are people under the age of 19. So the issue is the data is overwhelming and the data by race ethnicity is overwhelming. There are some groups that are marginalized and disproportionately impacted. Next slide, please. We had 40 years of progress, and there has been progress. Um, however, we are not to the point where we need to be after 40 years. It is time to end the HIV epidemic. It is time to put the epidemic in the rearview mirror. 
But we have to do that through multiple ways. We have to engage basic scientists. A vaccine is always desirable. It's the most effective public health strategy we have. We have to engage our clinicians. Every clinical encounter is an opportunity to assess for risk behaviors and to intervene. And if you don't feel comfortable intervening, to make a referral to a community agency that will address those issues. And finally, we have to engage our parents and our school system. Young people spend a great deal of time at school. They spend a great deal of time at home. We have to get everyone on point, on the same page, all saying this, having the same message. Next slide, please. Ah, so I want to thank you again. I welcomed you in multiple tongues. I want to thank you in multiple languages as well. I hope this has been enjoyable. I hope I've given you some information and I hope I've also motivated you to be engaged in helping to end the HIV epidemic. Next slide, please. That's it. I think we'll stop right there. Go back one. All right, thank you. So if you have questions, delighted to take them. All right, thank you, Dr. Day, for that, for joining us today and sharing your expertise on and perspective on the HIV prevention services needed for adolescents. Um, before we conclude and open it up to Q&A, we want to virtually present you with a small token of our appreciation. Oh. So give me just one second to share my screen again. Oh, who's that? So this is uh, Dean Craig Blakely. So on behalf of the U of L School of Public Health and Information Sciences and, and our Student Government Association, <laughs> we will be sending you a genuine Louisville sweater. Wow. And Dean Blakely had to step away, um, but we had a picture of him with his own Louisville sweater bat. So we will be uh, getting that to you in the mail. Um, so again, thank you. I know we're running short on time. Um, but like I said earlier, uh, Dr. DiClemente has agreed to stay on to answer some questions. Um, so before we go to the Q&A, um, just want to let everybody know about our upcoming uh, Woodson keynote. Um, it'll be on February 23rd with Dr. Joseph McCormick. So please save the date. Uh, we will send that information and drop that in the chat where you can register for that. And um, on that note, we will open it up to questions and I will turn it back over to Dr. DiClemente. Oh, okay. If you actually, rather than putting the question in the chat, if you, if you feel comfortable, would you be okay asking the question? Yes, I will. I will go through and read these. And then if anybody um, wants to ask a question, uh, I can also unmute you. So just send me a note and I can do that or raise your hand. I'll jump okay. in and ask this first question from Barbara okay. Cave. Um, how easy is it for adolescents to access pre-exposure prophylaxis? Do adolescents report feeling stigmatized in addressing PrEP? Uh, I, I, think, I think you're right on the stigma front. One of the issues we haven't fully resolved, adolescents or adults, is stigma. HIV-associated stigma, and in fact, treatment-associated stigma. Um, but there is some stigma attached. Uh, on the other hand, I think we have to spin that around. The fact that you're taking PrEP or a, someone is taking PrEP is a really positive sign that they're concerned about their health and they're concerned about their partner's health as well. So I think, yes, there's a bit of stigma. Why am I needing PrEP? Who am I having sex with? In fact, it's the same stigma, if you will, that was associated with condom use or birth control pills. Why do you need birth control pills? Why do I need to use condoms? Um, 
So uh, yes, but it's it's the same issue repeated in a different uh, a sort of old wine in a new bottle. Uh, but prep uptake has not been as uh, prevalent the uptake as we would like it to be. There's still a lot of folks who could be using prep that are not. Next question, please. Great, yeah. So we had um, a few uh, questions that were pre-submitted as well. Um, and you may have covered a lot of this in your presentation, but um, we had one ask, how does your advocacy for STI prevention also discuss the stigma of diagnosis if it does happen? Oftentimes, sex education is all about prevention, but never discusses how to live once you have a diagnosis. How do you handle this conversation? Well, that's, that's always an important conversation and one that we're very sensitive to. Uh, and sometimes people are, in a sense, traumatized when they hear the news they have an STD. The, the immediate response is, how could that possibly be? Uh, so yes, I think what the best way to handle that conversation is to have qualified counselors and staff on board. So if you're gonna break that kind of news to someone, be prepared to address some of those questions about stigma and uh, about self-blame, in fact. Thank you for answering that. Um, we had a couple more that were submitted um, that were also asking about PrEP and you may have just addressed this, mm -hmm. but um, I'm gonna combine them. So. Um, and I think you might have touched on this in your last answer, but are, are any adolescents under the age of 18 able to consent for PrEP and do their parents have to know if they go on it? And then um, how well are adolescents able to keep up with the demands of PrEP, such as labs, telehealth, office visits, refills, et cetera? No, well, those are all good questions. Uh, who gets PrEP? I think you would have to check with the local jurisdictions, uh, the Kentucky for example, Department of Health may be the folks to touch base with if a young folk person in Kentucky would like to get pro. How well do adolescents maintain regimens, health regimens? Well, uh, again, the, the scientific community recognizes that adherence is a problem, whether it's young people or adults. Adherence has always been a major issue in medicine and in public health. So now there are available long acting PrEP. So that can be injected under the skin, much like Depro-Provera, and they can provide months of, of treatment. Uh, and then people would just come back on a regular basis uh, every three, four months, et cetera. Uh, but that doesn't mean people are going to use the medication. That is, or come back for that matter. Uh, I think part of it is what we said earlier on. It's the type of relationship that young people develop with their providers that is so critical. Do they trust their providers? Do the providers allow the young people to take some ownership of their treatment? Do the providers allow the young people to ask questions and answer those questions in an understandable format? I think these are all key issues, but the, it's, it goes back to that patient provider interaction and relationship. Great, thank you. Um, I believe that was the last of our questions. So if anybody has, um, Anything else, feel free to drop it in the chat. I'm gonna make one final announcement here on behalf of SGA. Uh, they wanted me to let everyone, all of our students know that it's December 1st uh, to celebrate World AIDS Day. They're going to have a, a sip and paint event um, to discuss the importance of prevention and reducing stigma. And it's free for U of L students in the Red Barn from five to seven. And there will be free HIV testing and food and activities. So uh, any students feel free to come out to that uh, this evening. So um, to conclude with that, we will be wrapping it up here. Again, thank you, Dr. DiClemente. We will 
um, have a copy of your presentation to share as well as a recording of this to send out to um, all participants. So if anybody uh, missed it or had to step away, we will have that available as well. Yeah, and as always, if anyone has a question subsequently, feel free to email me and then we can arrange to have a, uh, a Zoom conversation. Great, and we can provide that um, contact information if anybody reaches out to as well and, and help um, foster that connection. So uh, my pleasure and, and thank you for all the good work you do. You're, you're all engaged in being, of course, healthcare professionals and health prevention professionals. Keep, keep the great work up, continued success. And, and most importantly, uh, it's hard to help others when we have to take care of ourselves as well. So take care of yourself, stay well, stay healthy, and have a great holiday.